Hello, good afternoon, Susan. Hello. Oh, oh, okay. Hi. Can you hear me? Oh, wait. Maybe I, I can't hear you. One second. I will just put out my Bluetooth. Yeah, I should be able to hear you now. Can you say something? Hello, Hello Susan. Oh, yeah, I can hear Good you. Good afternoon. Yeah. How are you, Susan? Fine, fine. Thank you so much. How are you? Yeah, thank you so much. <clears throat> Can we uh, start? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. Okay. YouTube, habis. YouTube sudah on, dok. Okay. Hello, hello. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hello, good afternoon and evening Indonesia. Good afternoon, India. Good day for our friends from all the rest of the world. It must be evening and night in Pacific, Australia and New Zealand. Afternoon and evening in Asia. Morning now in Europe and Africa. And early morning in North America, Central America and South America. First and foremost, thank you everyone for coming. Welcome to this international webinar that is attended by participants from 65 countries of six continents around the globe. We are gathering now this day all nations, citizens of the world, to be united for helping the people against blindness. Welcome to our distinguished 19th episode of Maestro Lecture. I am Gede Pardianto from Indonesia. Let's start the webinar. To honor the origin country of this webinar, please pay attention to Indonesian National Anthem. Thank you very much. Now, to honor the origin country of our distinguished speaker, please pay attention to Indian National Anthem.
Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. The great maestra this time will be Dr. Susan Jacob. She is a legend, a grandmaster, friend of mine, the lady, an inventor, the multiple awards winning, a great surgeon. Dr. Jacob is director and chief of Dr. Agarwal's Refractive and Cornea Foundation. She is a senior consultant, cataract and glaucoma service at Dr. Agarwal's group of eye hospital. Dr. Jacob has over 21 years of experience in cornea, refractive surgery, and cataract surgery. Her other fields of interest in ophthalmology include cutting edge, cataract, complex and complicated cases, anterior segment reconstruction procedures, glaucoma, and also orbit and oculoplasty. Susan is distinguished associate editor of Journal of Refractive Surgery, section editor and editorial advisory board member of INET of the American Academy of Ophthalmology, executive committee member, a council board member, and chair of Cornea Committee of the Global Education and Research Society of Ophthalmology. She is a member of Global Advisory Board at Cataract and Refractive Surgery Today, Europe section, and International Scientific Board member of Advanced Ophthalmologic Practice. Susan is also a member of Editorial Board of Journal of Refractive Surgery, Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, Glaucoma Today, Ocular Surgery News, Asia Pacific Edition, Euro Times, International Journal of Cratoconus and Ectatic Corneal Diseases, Medical Hypothesis in Optometry, Tamil Nadu Ophthalmologist Association, and Journal of Ophthalmic Science Research. Dr. Jacob has been the recipient of several prestigious international awards, including International Society of Refractive Surgery, Great Singer Memorial Award, Connecticut Society of Eye Physician Innovators Award, the Warring Medal for Editorial Excellence from Journal of Refractive Surgery, and European Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery John Hennahan Award for Young Ophthalmologists, and also American Academy of Ophthalmologists International Ophthalmologist Education Award prestigious power. List of the top 100 most influential women in ophthalmology in the world by the ophthalmologists and many international Horizon Award. Dr. Susan Jacob has published more than 200 articles in journal and books with more than 2 thousand and six hundred citation and she delivered hundreds of lectures at so many international meetings. Now she is going to deliver the maestro lecture to hundreds of participants from more than 65 countries of six continents around the world. Wow, that is so mind blowing. At this very moment, she will present a very important topic with the title Corneal Allogenic Intrastromal Ring Segment. It will be a really interesting topic. Now we are learning from the lady who is grandmaster on this field. So be prepared. Fellow ophthalmologists, let's pay attention to Dr. Susan Jacob. So Susan, we are counting down for you. Five, four, three, two, one. Time is yours. Lift off. Go ahead, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gede, for that. Uh, a really, really uh, a nice introduction. Uh, please let me know if you are hearing me because I, I'm not sure if I am having any internet issues. Is my voice heard clearly? Yeah, clear, Susan. 
or is there a lag? Okay. Could you share your screen? Yes, can you hear me? Are you able to hear me? Yeah, I'm hearing you. Okay, uh, is it uh, clear and uh, uh, continuous or is it broken? All right, please share your All screen. Right. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gede, for that uh, really, uh, really, really nice introduction that you gave me. And I am really honored to come here to this Maestro lecture. I uh, just saw the list of people who, who have presented prior to me and uh, really hats off you for, to you for organizing this uh, uh, wonderful, really educational uh, series that you have created. It's uh, really going to be of so much benefit to all the people who have uh, who are uh, not just watching this one, but even the previous episode. So uh, congratulations for this. And uh, thank you so much for doing, uh, you know, such great series. And uh, I will just uh, share my screen. As Dr. Gede already said, my talk is on corneal allogenic intrastromal ring segments. And uh, I hope my uh, screen is being seen now. Uh, okay. Uh, 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 Gede, my screen is seen. Yes, perfect. Okay, and my voice is also clear, right? Okay, perfect. Okay. I also have my WhatsApp on. So in case you're not able to hear me at any time, please just send me a message. So my talk is on CARES. Uh, the, the acronym uh, CARES stands for corneal allogenic intrastromal ring segments. And this is a coin, a term that I had coined uh, in 2015 uh, when we had started uh, just with this technique. And uh, at the outset, I must say that I do have a patent pending for special trephines devices and processes used to create these segments as well as for modified care segments. So when we look at um, CARES, the current treatment for CARES, uh, for keratoconus, we know that uh, cross-linking has really taken center stage here because very often you can halt progression completely using uh, corneal cross-linking. But the, the sad part about it is even though cross-linking is so good in terms of uh, halting progression, it does have a limited role in regularizing the corneal topography and improving vision. So patients are not very happy with just isolated cross-linking alone because they still have uh, more, uh, you know, desired, uh, they still desire more with respect to their uh, vision. Uh, the, the problem is most of these patients do have irregular astigmatism and the decrease in vision is uh, therefore quite significant for many of them. And since long, uh, corneal surgeons have been trying to treat this problem by implanting uh, intrastromal corneal ring segments or ICRS. So ICRS is really nothing new. It's been... Uh, it's been there for some time. And uh, we know that uh, there are a lot of commercially available uh, ICRS, which uh, are there in the market. And some of the examples are Intax, Kera rings, Ferrara rings, Mayo rings, Bicentic segments, and so on and so forth, with many new ones also coming up. But one thing that's common to all of these segments is that they're all made of artificial segments, PMMA or plastic. And even though they can improve the quality of vision quite a bit, uh, they can also have uh, complications. And uh, just, just to get a look at what the complications can be, uh, you can have uh, so many different kinds of complications. And you can see these are from my own series, all of these photographs when I used to be doing Intax uh, prior to 2015. But since 2015, we've completely stopped doing Intax and we're doing only cares. So some of the examples uh, here's a patient with overriding uh, you know that's basically migration of the segment overriding of the segment and that overriding can also be seen the anti-segment OCT this increase with time and uh, finally re resulted in necrosis uh, and uh, and extrusion of the segment you can have as seen in this case with a Kera ring uh, again uh, overlying stromal necrosis and melt and here the segment had to be removed uh, the melt leaving out leaving areas of thinned out uh, remaining stroma, which can lead to further complications, infectious keratitis, melt, and so on. And these are just some of my complications, but there are a lot of other complications reported in medical literature, even in terms of uh, intrusion of the segments and uh, acute high drops uh, suddenly developing. So I had this idea, as I said in 2015, about, uh, you know, how, how about, uh, you know, still trying to retain the beautiful results that you do get with ICRS, but trying to get rid of the complications. And the answer that I saw was basically uh, to try and implant allogenic uh, segments. So we published our series first in the Journal of Refractive Surgery. 
and uh, and uh, we uh, and i term this as i said as corneal allogenic intrastromal rings ring segments and allogenic uh, uh, cares basically refers to uh, as the term implies allogenic and this could be these segments can be created from fresh donor stroma, preserved donor stroma, processed donor stroma, basically any source of allogenic tissue. So it's not just as I will be showing you in uh, these uh, cases of mine where I've used donor conusclerial rims, uh, which are fresh or preserved, but you could also use processed segments or other sources of allogenic tissue. So here uh, is the double bladed trephine, uh, which is basically something that I had designed. And you can see it's got two concentric uh, blades one within the other. And what I do is I basically punch out uh, uh, the stromal segment from a uh, donor conius rim. But again, as I said, you can use other sources as well. And just to see this video in a little bit more detail, here's the uh, epithelium being removed. The endothelium is also removed. That's a double bladed refine, which uh, is going to be used to punch the donor stroma. And once the donor stroma is punched, you remove it from uh, the trephine. And then you can cut it into appropriate size segments. These are again instruments that I have uh, uh, basically designed uh, and uh, these are available with uh, Epsilon uh, Matin Amin. And you can use these to uh, insert these segments uh, into the uh, femtosecond laser dissector channels. So the patient has already had femtosecond laser dissector channels created in his eye and the keratoconic patient. And now we've gone ahead and implanted the cares and you can see uh, that it really goes in quite easily. So uh, it's not just femtosecond laser dissected uh, channels, but you could also implant these manually using manual uh, uh, semicircular keratomes. And these are available commercially uh, from different manufacturers. Uh, uh, my good friend Jack Parker from US uh, has uh, implanted a, a large series of cases using manually dissected channels. And he's also published this in the Journal of uh, Cataract and Refractive Surgery. So uh, here's uh, some post-operative images which are seen. Uh, this is, uh, as you can, if you look closely within the slit uh, of the slit lamp, you can see the uh, care segment lying there in the mid periphery. Uh, right over there and over there. And you can see the visual axis or the pupil is completely spared. So these are basically semicircular arc shaped segments. And you can see how they go. They, they basically are semicircular and they are circumferential to the pupil, but they do not cover the visual axis at all. And you can also notice how quiet they are lying within the eye, uh, absolutely without inciting any kind of inflammatory stimulus. So some other examples also, one second. Uh, of uh, CARES. Again, these are, are very old cases where we were implanting them more peripherally, uh, but you can see that we moved, uh, we made our optic zone a little smaller now in order to get uh, much greater effects. And I'll show you some of those examples uh, where we've avoided DALC in many cases and just done CARES in those patients. Anti-segment OCT images, which again show very well-placed segments, uh, which are not having any inflammatory response or edema of the surrounding cornea. And you can also see that uh, they are uh, very importantly placed at mid-stromal depth and unlike intacts, which are placed uh, much more low down uh, on the corneal, uh, on the cornea, uh, closer to the uh, endothelium and the dismissed membrane. So with intacts, you place it at around 75 to 80% depth, but with CARES, you can place it at 50% depth, which gives you a much greater clinical result as well. Again, you can see 330, 360 degree segment CARES, also broad segments. Uh, and again, a slit view showing the 50% depth of uh, implantation of the CARES. These are clinical, uh, these are basically uh, light microscopic images of the segments. Uh, and you can see very regular collagen orientation uh, in, in the longitudinal as well as cut section, showing that the care segments really have very good organization of the structure of the stroma. So the disadvantages of synthetic segments, which I mentioned earlier uh, of stromal thinning, necrosis, melt, et cetera, those are not just the only disadvantages. It's also the fact that synthetic segments cannot be implanted in very thin corneas uh, where you have less than 400 to 450 microns in the zone of implantation or very steep corneas, which uh, are more than 58 diopters. So generally, if you have uh, corneas that are stratoconic corneas that are uh, steeper than 58 diopters, you would try to avoid implanting an, an artificial segment. And that is a big disadvantage because many of the patients uh, who present to us do have uh, much higher keratometric values and all of them therefore are uh, removed or are uh, intaxes or keratorings rings are contraindicated for all those patients. So deep, uh, as I said, implantation is also another uh, disadvantage because it limits the amount of effect that you can get from it. And finally, also you do need FDA approval for different thicknesses and different arc lengths. So it's difficult to have such a big inventory of, uh, of uh, intacts or uh, artificial segments with you in your hospital. Uh, and you cannot suddenly decide to change your plan. So you need to plan ahead, get the uh, segments from, uh, from the uh, dealer. And sometimes you'll not get the thickness or the arc length which you would have actually desired for the patient.
an example of intax compared with cares and this we published uh, in our chapter on cares in yanov and duker uh, with the latest edition and you can see the icrs uh, looking very different from the cares and also the placement uh, there's anti segment oct showing the deep placement as compared to the uh, midstromal placement of cares uh, and also the difference uh, this is rate uh, you know it's a lucent uh, radiolucent uh, uh, image as well as cares is basically uh, like the stroma so as I said, uh, CARES uh, has the advantage of not just avoiding complications, but also the fact that you can use it in much more advanced cases and not just advanced cases, but you can also put it in mild and early cases. So an entire range of uh, keratoconic patients can be uh, treated with CARES right from very early to very uh, advanced stages. You can get more, uh, you can get greater effect and arc segments up to 360 degrees can be easily fashioned immediately, customized right there in your OR and implanted easily. Here's an example of an advanced case where we've, uh, you know, this is a preoperative uh, topographic map, map, the postoperative topographic map, and the amount of flattening, the difference map that is seen here. So may, I'll be showing you a lot of difference maps here. And what you have to understand is this difference map is basically uh, the difference between the pre and the post-op, and that shows you the amount of flattening. And when you get large areas of blue or, uh, or violet colors, uh, you know that the, that's, that's the amount of flattening that's been got. So here you can see a value of even 30.7. So you've got about 30 diopters of flattening, which is huge amount of flattening and you can see a value that was here of around 72 it's come to the yellow areas around 41 so uh, so that's the amount of flattening you can bring these patients almost into the normal range of uh, of uh, keratometric values and you can avoid dalk you would have probably done dalk for this patient but you brought him to very near normal ranges of keratometric values and so the patient really improves a lot even in the visual uh, acuity and quality this, these are shine plug images. Uh, these are basically two images, uh, the pre and the post-op, which have been taken along the same axis. And both the images have been superimposed one on top of each other, one on top of the other, and they've been aligned on the front surface of the lens. So you can actually see how much uh, CARES has brought about a flattening of the cornea. Uh, the one that you see on the top is a pre-operative image, and the lower one you can see has the CARES segment inserted in there. That's a post-operative image. And the difference, so this is how you can see that the flattening has been brought about by the CARES segment. And this is also a very nice way to explain to the patient how uh, the surgery is going to benefit him. We've done it again, as I said, in very thin cases. Here you can see a cornea of a stromal thickness of only 230 microns. Uh, this was a thin area. This was a small area of this extreme thinning. Uh, so there was just a very small area of extreme thinning. Even the other areas were thin, but this particular area, which was so thin, uh, we might have thought of doing a dial, but this patient uh, had cerebral palsy and he, he came from another city. He had to be transported by his friends. So we opted instead for going for uh, a CARES so just because the amount of follow-up that would be required would be less. And this would also apply not just for cerebral palsy, but also for patients with Down syndrome, where again, you want to avoid uh, DALC for various reasons. Uh, the amount of care that's required for DALC is far more than what would be required for CARES. Uh, and so uh, you can really uh, uh, ha handle these difficult to manage patients much more easier with, with CARES in terms of suture neovascularization, uh, suture uh, loosening, uh, astigmatism, uh, and even, uh, you know, uh, uh, dehiscence in patients who are not able to talk cooperate uh, with even minimal trauma. So really it becomes a much, much uh, uh, more beneficial surgery to do in these advanced cases. Indications are many, uh, as I said, just not, not just keratoconus, but uh, you, you, uh, progressive keratoconus, but even stable keratoconus where cross-linking has already been done or with age, it's become uh, stable. You could also do it for other corneal ectasias and irregular corneas, as I'll show you some examples soon. And you can also do it for synthetic segment complications as seen in this image where, uh, and this was a patient with intact melt and we replaced it with a care segment. And I'll also show you the video. Uh, at this point, I'm also happy to say that CARES is not being not just done by uh, uh, me in India, but uh, other centers in India, as well as uh, multiple centers in the United States, uh, in Canada, Australia, uh, South Africa, Turkey, Dr. Island Kilich is doing Israel, Dr. Israel, uh, uh, Lebanon, uh, Dr. Shady Award is doing Dominican Republic, Germany, Ireland, and so many other uh, doctors, you know, Ireland, Dr. Arthur Cumming is doing so. It's really, it's really had a large uptake among many cornea specialists and also be, it's not just the doctors, but also patients who come in, who, who are hearing about it from social media, hearing it about the results firsthand from other patients who also come to us uh, inquiring about uh, this, this procedure and wanting to get the benefits of this procedure. So uh, an example of how we've treated uh, post-intact melt, uh, this is the uh, area of melt. Uh, and uh, what we're doing here is fashioning the care segment. Uh, and then we go back to the patient's eye and we remove, once you remove that epithelium, you'll see that the area of melt is actually much bigger than what you had thought it is. 
Uh, so that's really a large area of melt and you can understand that it's really not wise to leave these patients like this. So uh, what we've done is remove that segment and then we go ahead and replace, put that care segment, which we had just cut, uh, put it on top of the area of defect and assess the amount of tissue that you want to uh, uh, fill into the defect. And then you suture both the ends in place, insert it into the same tunnel essentially, and then also put anchoring sutures uh, as well as bridging sutures. And then you put some glue over it uh, on the sides and then finally put a bandage contact lens. And uh, we've also published a series on... Uh, uh, post intact or post synthetic segment melts that have been treated by CARES uh, with my friend Shady Award. He's actually done most of the work and we published this together and, uh, and I'm happy to say it's uh, there in the print now. So here's one, the example that you just saw, the post-operative appearance with CARES on one side and intact on the other side. And here's also another patient uh, with a similar uh, you know, uh, presentation where he had a melt. Uh, and here you can see that we've inserted again the segment all the way in the intact segment the, un, un, the one which was uh, which had not melted is still left in place. And you can generally see that the one that's not melted is generally the supranasal one and the infrotemporal one, which is obviously the weakest area of the cornea, is the one that you generally see these melts in. And um, you can also see the anterior segment OCT here of this particular patient, the one on the right-hand side. And you can see the segment is not just filling the uh, channel uh, on the edges, but also filling up that stromal defect here in the center. And you can see that stromal defect completely filled with a very good... Uh, uh, appearance, uh, the surface appearance, and uh, another uh, anti segment OCD showing the cares on one side and the intacts on the other side. And here's another patient where you can see that post cares is actually flattened out more. So, uh, again, shine flug images showing the flattening that can be obtained with cares. You can see the green, the one in blue has the care segment there, and the one in orange is pre operative. And uh, you, can, you can use these to ex explain to the patient. Some topographic examples. Sorry. Uh, this is a patient uh, who uh, basically uh, had cares in both the eyes. Uh, you can see the cares on the right-hand side is thicker and the one on the left-hand side is thinner. And that's because he had a greater refractive error and more steeper corneas in the right, on the right eye. He, is, uh, he was 20 or 618 uncorrected. Uh, Post-operatively, I'm happy to say he improved to 69. And from a cylinder of minus, point, minus 7 cylinder, uh, pre-operatively, he says cylinder dropped down to 2.5. So that you can see is a huge drop from 7 to 2.5, which really results in huge amount of visual improvement for the patient. And the reason you can see why his cylinder dropped is just because of the regularization that CARES gives. So again, the, the pre-operative map here, the post-operative map in the center and the difference map, and you can see that the difference map shows that CARES did not just flatten the pre-operative steep axis, you can see the flattening here, but also steepen the pre-operative flat axis a bit, and that uh, flattening in one axis and steepening of the previously fla uh, flat axis gives you an overall regularization and a reduction in the cylinder and a better improved visual quality. So the patient was so happy with the right eye that he opted to go for cares in the left eye also. And here we had, it's, you can see it's a very early uh, keratoconus. Uh, his refractive error was only minus one with minus one point, I think, uh, uh, two five uh, cylinder. And uh, uh, he improved up to a 0 0.5, 0 0.5 sphere and 0.5 cylinder. And you can see the minimal amount of flattening that we've been able to get by just decreasing the uh, thickness of the cares. Another patient who underwent cares with cross linking on the right eye and only cross linking in the left eye. And you can see the obvious difference. The cross linking alone, really, there's not much difference between the pre and the post op. Uh, everything is green, which means that really there's not much difference. Whereas in the cares with cross linking, you can see the pre is that, the post is that. There's a lot of flattening which has been got by implanting the segments and the vision improved from 2250 to 2020 part, which of course is a huge amount of improvement. Patient was so happy with the right eye vision that uh, and so unhappy with the left eye vision that she came back later for doing a cares for the left eye also which here you can see on the right hand side um sorry and uh, this is post cares in the left eye and you can, the flattening obtained in the left eye as well and she improved from 2200 to 2060 or uh, 660 to 618 uncorrected and of course the best character improved to 66 again other topographic examples this croissant kind of uh, uh, keratoconus for keratoconic phenotype has improved and flattened out a lot as you can see here with the decrease in the cylinder uh, we've also put asymmetric cares and uh, uh, what i mean by that is you can see here the thickness is more and the thickness is less on the other segment so you can put asymmetric cares depending on how much of flattening you want on either side of the meridia and you can uh, customize that the other big advantage of cares is that there are no complaints of glare or other photic phenomena because this is just corneal tissue unlike uh, synthetic segments or plastic segments which can reflect light off and cause glare or uh, photic phenomena mm -hmm. to the patients 
Single segment cast can be put for decentered uh, corneas. Here you can see a decentered cone. I mean, uh, the decentered cone, we've implanted only a single segment here, and that's given you that flat thing that you need here. And again, the regularization of the topography seen, the steep area has become flat. The previously flat area has become slightly steep, as you can see, which gives you that overall regular uh, cornea. And uh, that's how you uh, get such good results with the uh, cares. Here's another patient uh, with an asymmetric or decentered cone, more advanced case. You can see values of 76 here, and we've got about 14, 15 diopters of flattening here uh, with a single decentered segment. That's a day one uh, post-operative appearance. So the patient who already undergone C3R previously was not happy with his vision, and he came from Calcutta to get cares done by us. And uh, you can see the day one post-operative appearance with a quiet eye. Uh, this is a, again another example of single segment cares and you can see compared to the previous example where I showed you about 10 to 14 diopters of flattening here you've got about 2.13 3.5 diopters of flattening and that's how you can actually uh, vary the amount of uh, effect that you want to get by changing the optic zone the thickness of the cornea the depth of implantation and so on and so forth. So asymmetric cares need not be just the thickness, but it could also be asymmetry with relation to the arc length here. You can see a longer arc length here. You can see a shorter arc length above and the improvement on vision was from 5 by 60 uncorrected to 618 uncorrected and uh, the improvement in best corrected from 69 part to 66 part. But what's even more notable is the difference in the topography. The longer arc segment you can see has given greater flattening and the shorter arc has given uh, lesser flattening. And you can also see a decrease in all the parameters K1, K2, K mean, um, astigmatism, K max, and so on and so forth. Uh, longer segments, these are 330 degree segments which have been implanted and corresponding changes in the topography. The one on the left hand side shows near normalization of the topography. Um, also, uh, one more thing that we've started doing uh, uh, and which is really of great interest is uh, you, you might have heard of Kera rings which have asymmetric ICRS, uh, that is basically progressive thickness ICRS. So if you look at these uh, images, uh, basically, the thickness of the uh, of the uh, segment increases from one side and decreases towards the other. So these are five millimeter arc segments which are there commercially available, and they're available as 160 degrees or 150 degrees. And you can have a progress a progression of the thickness uh, from about 150 to about uh, uh, 200 microns, uh, clockwise or anti-clockwise. And you could also have these almost 330 degree arc segments, which could have the sinusoidal thickening, which means thinner on the top and thicker at the bottom or thinner in the bottom and then thicker in the middle. So you can have these, these are fixed segment combinations which are available from Kera rings, uh, which have different thicknesses. And basically these are for specific phenotypes of keratoconus. So specific phenotypes sometimes do well with uh, with uh, specific types of uh, uh, you know, uh, shapes, types and shapes and thicknesses of, uh, of uh, segments. And that's what Kera ring did. And they've got very good visual results, but we also um, uh, customized our care segments also. And you can see here is a care segment, which is again customized or progressive thickness. And you can see there's a taper here, uh, which we've created because we wanted less flattening in this area of the topography. So on the other side is uh, full thickness and we've just uh, submitted all this also for publication. Uh, and uh, here you can see us using these customized segments and the advantage of these customized segment of ours over the ones that are available is commercially in with the synthetic implants is that you can really customize much more so with those you have the fixed ones which are available commercially and you have to buy them and kind of uh, adapt them to all the types of uh, to with different kinds of patients who may differ in their steepness or in their uh, area of uh, flatness required and so on but here we are actually customizing it to the particular patient we are treating so uh, we've put this segment in and uh, sometimes we use a reverse inski from the other side to pull it into position uh, and that's basically, and then, then we generally combine it with cross-linking at the end of surgery if the patient is not already cross-linked. Uh, and, and that's how uh, we do the surgery. So customization is a big thing that we are uh, doing for many of our patients, and it's given us even greater results than when we started out with. Here is, uh, the again, uh, uh, a technique of uh, uh, how we do it currently. Uh, this is the trefine, as I said, the two blades. We have removed the epithelium and the endothelium, sorry. And we have used the trefine to punch it out. Once we punch it out, we make sure that both the cuts are complete and then we uh, see the inner central cornea, which could uh, be used for a penetrating keratoplasty or a dial if you want to. And we remove that uh, ring of stromal tissue from the trefine. Then we go ahead and cut it into two segments. And, uh, and then what we do is we uh, basically use this. This is a 
uh, degree zone marker that I've designed and uh, um, Epsilon is manufacturing this for me now at, uh, in, in titanium. And uh, soon they'll be having an entire set for cares, uh, which, which uh, will help you do the surgery without having to customize or fashion your own instruments. So you can see we uh, basically marked out the exact uh, length of arc length of, uh, of the segment that we need to implant in the patient's eye. And so there's no uh, rough assessments. It comes to an exact uh, length as you would want. And, and that helps us to uh, put the tissue in as seen here, cut it to the exact length and push, push it in. Uh, and that makes our surgery more easy and predictable now. We also have started doing an epithelial side marking and that's basically uh, uh, similar, except that after cutting, what we do is we uh, take a marker pen and then mark the epithelial side. So the epithelial side is obviously the lower side. We mark it and then uh, we cut the segment. And you can see here, uh, the top side is marked and the bottom side, which is endothelial side is not marked. We cut it then, the ring, and then we flatten it. And if you look at this uh, very carefully, you'll see that the epithelial side is uh, thicker than the endothelial side. And that's how, that's what we read about the anatomy of the <coughs> structure of the cornea, that the epithelium is always stronger than the endothelium. So we prefer to have the epithelial, of course, when I say epithelial, I don't mean epithelium because we remove epithelium, rather I'll say Bowman side. The Bowman side we know is stronger. And so we, uh, even when we do cares, we prefer to place the Bowman side towards the uh, pupil so we get better act, uh, better better visualization or better uh, action that way or better effect that way. And again, here we have uh, marked the epithelial side. We put it around uh, at the optic zone that's marked on this that we are going to use. And then we mark uh, with a, a marker pen uh, the degree that we want. If there are any tapers, we would mark that out also. You can see those marks here. We cut it to the exact length that we need. And then we are ready to put it into the patient side. And as I said, the epithelial side needs to face towards the uh, visual axis. So that's the post-op. And you can see very often with the uh, Maloney keratometer that you get uh, very good circular myas. Customized cares need not be just uh, tapered uh, at one edge. Uh, we can also taper it centrally. Here you can see uh, you know, the B, uh, the B, C, and D scans. And you can see the thickness varying here. It's about 496 microns around over here. Uh, when you come to the center, C, it's only 370 microns. And again, at the bottom, it's 511 microns. So you can have centrally tapered cares uh, with progressive thickness. Another patient where you've got centrally tapered cares, and you might ask, what is the purpose of doing this? The purpose is exactly this. You can see here and here where you have thicker segments, you can get a greater degree of flattening. And where you put thinned out the segment a bit, the degree of flattening that you get is less. And so you can actually customize it so much to your patient. So you, you more than even than you can do with synthetic segments progressive thickness synthetic segments, you can actually customize it to a large extent, looking at the topography, looking at the clock art, and then taking that uh, degree zone marker, which I designed and putting your segment along that and marking it out exactly will give you a huge amount of customization, which is really not possible with any synthetic segment. This is a densitometric map. And here also you can show, see the central taper. Uh, you can, uh, again, as I said, taper cares. And that, that again shows a beautiful classical example of how you can vary the amount of, uh, you know, effect that you get in different axes. You can see where it's thick, you've got a greater effect and where it goes thin or thins out, you've got a lesser effect. And that's what you wanted to do. You can have arc lens customized. Uh, uh, you know, these are both single end tapered uh, segments, but with different arc lens, smaller one on this side, larger one on the other side. Mm. Again, different amounts of customization, and you can also see the regularization here with a flattening here and a slight compensatory steepening on the other side. Um, so, uh, so there's a lot of spot customization which you can do with regard to your particular patient, which gives it a lot of advantage. And this is just to show that we are also so confident of our procedure that we have been doing it on children now for some time, and we should probably should get our paper out on pediatric care soon, uh, where uh, where we are able to do this, and you can see the almost beautiful regularization in the visual axis where the keratometric values have come to much more near normal levels than it was preoperatively. And this patient has also had a, uh, a tapered segment. You see the drop in all the values, K1, K2, K-mean, astigmatism, uh, K-max, everything you can see has dropped down and the patient has become better, uh, which translates the same patient that I just showed you, the visual acuity, 618 pre-op to 69 uncorrected post-op, and also drop in the sphere, spherocylindrical, the, so the, the uh, spherical equivalent comes down and the visual, uh, the best character visual acuity also improves. Progressive thickness cares, again, uh, the thickness is shown along different axes, varying according to how you've cut it. This is, again, uh, slightly centrally tapered cares that we've made. You could taper it at both ends uh, alternately, as you can see here. Uh, so in this case, both ends are tapered, and that will also give you a, a different kind of effect. Uh, 
here's a patient who's at a very broad gears and you can see we've got about 34 35 diopters of uh, steepening and you this is this is very different classically so if you look at this patient this is a, a not the typical keratoconus here there's a superior steepening that's got, been got about 96.7 diopters which is humongous we've uh, got about 35 diopters of flattening in the exact area that we wanted it to flatten out and and we've got a better topography postoperatively and avoided a dialc in this patient so uh, the other advantage that uh, in almost all patients you see is the decrease in coma and the spherical ab uh, aberration as well as the total uh, uh, higher order aberrations. So here you can see in the uh, five and six millimeter zone, uh, the coma has dropped from 2.467 to 0.764 in five millimeter zone and 3.43 to about 0.35 in the six millimeter zone, which is a huge drop in coma as you, coma, comatic aberrations, as you can see. And that obviously translates to much better visual quality of the patient. And that's the reason the patients are so happy. If you also look at the RMS values, the higher order vibrations you can see have dropped, the total RMS has dropped, uh, you know, the peak to valley has dropped. And it, again, if you look at the coma from 3.4, it has dropped to 0 0.17, which again is a big drop. And so you get better and more happy patients. Again, my friend Shady Awar has this uh, this uh, beautiful website, which is created, conlayanalysis.com, which we often use for analyzing our post-operative outcomes, where you can you know exactly measure the arc length and things like that. This was our first paper, which we had published uh, in JRS, which showed that uh, we had improvement in almost all parameters, uncorrected and best corrected visual acuity, spherical equivalent, topographic astigmatism, maximum k-metry, k steepest k, anterior and posterior best fit spheres, mean power, all of these had improved and uh, uh, the, uh, the CARES article had actually made it to the cover page uh, of that particular issue of the JRS. Now, it's not just keratoconus, but we've also used it for post-classic ectasia. And uh, you can see here uh, an example of post-classic ectasia. We're using, as you can see, a tapered, say, a customized CARES tapered on one end. And uh, we just, uh, you know, uh, here you can see us uh, push it in. Uh, so it goes in easily, as you can see. Then you can just slide it along a little bit and then use the other incision to pull it into further position. And what how we do is we uh, uh, make a note of the clock hours where these should lie eventually. And uh, that's how we uh, keep it at the end. So then we combine this with cross-linking. So CAS alone is going to improve the topography. But if you also want to stabilize the disease, remember that you also have to do cross-linking. So uh, in a patient who's far too advanced to do cross-linking, that's the only patient I would do that. If I can do cross-linking at all, I will do combined CAS and uh, cross-linking. And remember that cross-linking now has... Uh, uh, reach the stage where you can do very advanced cases also cross-linking. So my own personal technique of contact lens assisted corneal cross-linking, with that we've been able to cross-link a huge number of very advanced keratoconus also. And when you combine it with CARES, it gives you beautiful results in terms of vision as well as stability. Again, uh, the, the topographic appearance of this patient with post classic ectasia, that's a post-op appearance. You can see the huge uh, improvement in the topography and also the improvement in uh, uncorrected from 618 to 69 and best corrected from 69 part to 66 part and the drop in the spherocylindrical uh, refractive error. So our indications have really started increasing uh, these are different cases of post classic ectasia just i just put this is the same patient that we saw earlier just to show you how all the parameters have decreased so uh, the k1 k2 k max uh, k k mean have all decreased the astigmatism dropped from 4.5 to 2.9 and the k max also dropped uh, the uh, k max also dropped uh, by about 5.4 diopters uh, and so the patient obviously did very well this is a very interesting case actually uh, this particular patient uh, this was a patient who had uh, who had a DALC in the, who had a CARES in the, sorry, who was a child who we saw in 2019. Uh, he, uh, this was the appearance, uh, but the other I had uh, advanced keratoconus. So we did a DALC. This was extremely advanced. We did a DALC. The patient eventually ended up with a seven diopter cylinder in this eye. In 2019, his uh, the other eye, the better eye was like this. In 2020, uh, we started to see some changes. He came back in 2021, and by the time it was far advanced, and the gap happened, though we had said he has to be under very close observation. Uh, unfortunately, due to the COVID pandemic, they could not come or they did not come for follow-up. And by the time he came in 2021, it was advanced and overt keratoconus. So what we did in this eye for this pediatric, for this child, this child was a 10-year-old child. We did cross-linking and cares in the, uh, in the right eye. And you can see uh, this was 2020 scan. Uh, this was 2019 scan. And you can see the progression. We did cares. Post CARES, this was the topography, and pre CARES, this was, of course, the topography. And if you look at this difference map, so the difference map between 2020 to 2019 and post CARES to pre CARES, this is exactly almost a mirror image. Here is the steepening, 
and here is the flattening exactly mirror, mirroring the steepening. So what you have done, the flattening that you've got, you can see exactly mirrors the steepening that this child had unfortunately had. And so you've gone back actually to the pre-COVID pre levels. You know, you've gone, taken his topography back by a few years, made him almost uh, regress his keratoconus by a few years to where he was previously. And so his, uh, you know, the, his visual acuity improved, his uh, spherocylindrical error was low, 612 with the minus 1.5 cylinder in 2019 and, uh, and and 2020, it was 0.75 with 0.5 cylinder 66. So he really improved. And the reason I said this, show this example is that KS can give really good refractive errors. And uh, even though this advanced case obviously needed DALC, DALC is not an answer always because it can also be associated with irregular astigmatism as seen in this case or high levels of astigmatism, as you saw here, seven diopters, anatomically beautiful DALC, but still uh, uh, quite a bit of astigmatism. Again, these are other examples of post elastic ectasia. I don't think I will show this to you because we've already seen that. But here's the post-operative appearance of that patient whose video I just skipped through. And you can again see the flattening in the steep area. That's another thing that CARES gives you. It kind of mirrors the flat steep area so that you get a flattening uh, exactly corresponding to that. Again, the uh, uh, coma you can see has dropped from about minus 4.065 to minus 1.139, which again improves the visual acuity for the patient and the spherical and the HO is also improved. So as I said, CAS is really a better alternative to DALC. It's not just the mild cases that you can use it for, but also the advanced cases. Why would you, you want to use CAS in advanced cases? Basically, because uh, CAS plus thin cornea cross-linking techniques are available now, such as CAC Excel, that's a far better alternative. Uh, you know, PK and DALC do provide satisfactory uh, outcomes, but you ha often have side threatening complications. PK, of course, we all know has rejection, but even though, and though DALC doesn't have as much rejection as PK has, it can still be associated with irregular astigmatism and other complications as I'll show you. So, and also the other thing is that many of these patients present young, so they require transplantation early in life if you're going to opt for a transplantation. And over their lifetime, they may require more than one graft. And that increased number of grafts, of course, results in an increased risk of failure with successive transplantations. So CARES for visual rest restoration can be very effective. Uh, and in many cases, you can completely avoid a DALC and, and at the least, you can at least delay the DALC. And uh, the advantage is that DALC can offer, DALC is, it's not that once you do CARES, you can never do a DALC. You can always do a DALC safely even after CARES. But the reverse is not true. If you go ahead to the DALC straight away, you cannot go back, you know, go back in time and do a CARES again. Here's an example where we were otherwise done a DALC, but we did a CARES and cross-linking. Some examples of problems that can happen even with DALC, urid syndrome, interface haze, uh, neovascularization, lipid exudation, surface issues, uh, lipid exudation again, melt, uh, corneal melts, loose sutures, uh, surface issues, and so on and so forth, high astigmatism. So all of these can, uh, you know, denervation of the cornea, uh, loosening of the sutures with time. These are all problems that happen with the care, uh, DAL, which are avoided completely with CARES. And the best part is you can also combine CARES with bioptics, such as topograded PRK, fake EKIOL, uh, refractive lens exchange, conducted keratoplasty, so on and so forth. It's really a uh, very reversible and very adjustable procedure. It retains all of the host cornea. So it prefers, it preserves the ability to offer any future developments in the treatment for keratoconus to the patient. It's a reversible procedure that cares can be taken out easily. Unlike DALC, which once done is reverse irreversible and it's a done deal for the patient. And it does not prevent, CARES does not prevent a DALC or a PK from being done in the future. So here's an example of a, a CARES being taken out. And you can see that this was immediate post-op actually. Uh, we wanted to remove it and uh, put in a different thickness, but you can see how easily it came out. I'll show you another example of a slightly more uh, uh, about a year away. Uh, sorry, this is uh, again adjustability, a video to show you how you can adjust it. We had uh, this patient where we thought we could get better effects. So here you can see this is the original position, but we wanted to rotate it and we thought we'll get a better effect by rotating it. Uh, so you can see all we do is slide it along and now we've come to this level. So it's adjustable, it's uh, removable, it's adjustable. And it doesn't take away your ability to do a DALC. So here's a patient who underwent a CARES uh, from, patient came from North India, was away uh, again because of pandemic. They did not come for follow-up. They came back a year later, young child, uh, eye rubber did not stop rubbing the eyes and came back with progression. We uh, had to go ahead and do a DALC because you can see even the oil droplet sign here. And uh, uh, I wanted to see how the difficult it would be to take this CARES out because this was one year post-op. So, and I also wanted to see whether having the CARES in there would interfere with the DAG. So my plan was to try and remove one CARES and retain the other, uh, one CARES segment and retain the other, which would let me uh, get me the answer to both these questions. So I've marked the uh, 
area of trephination. I'm going to try and remove the DALC, uh, the segment, the CAS on the left hand side. You can see what I have to do is there are basically some edits, much like a DZ lenticule, where there's some addition at the periphery or at the edges of the uh, you know tissue. Uh, you, I had to you know release those additions at the edges using a, a, a instrument, a rod, and then I could just pull it out. So it, I did have to release those additions, but even a year later I could pull it out. And the second segment I retained it there, and that's the second segment to see if it would in, if it would interfere with the DAL technique. And I found to my delight that it didn't. Uh, it ap actually didn't at all. Uh, here's the big bubble being formed. You can see that's that's the perfect big bubble being formed. Even with the segment in situ, there's a segment, and then we could just complete the surgery. Uh, just do it as a dial. You know, quadriceps the tissue, remove the uh, uh, the anterior stroma, uh, and then finally go ahead and put uh, the donor cornea. And this is the post-operative day one appearance. And then we also wanted to know what happens to the segment with time over one year. So we sent it for histopathology. And this was a histopathological report of the CARES. This was the rest of the, the host cornea, uh, which was removed. And uh, the result was basically that uh, uh, the fragment shows a fibrocollagenous stroma, only no evidence of edema or inflammation, which was great. And you can also see very well-preserved tissue structure. Uh, one question that's always asked to me is, what about the change in segment thickness with time? Does it change with time? Uh, the answer is really no. Uh, these are uh, examples from 2019, 2020, and 2021, where you can see the ASOST measurements that we've done are remaining almost the same, 210 microns thickness, 220 microns, 205 microns. And this, and we have seen over the year in uh, uh, the, our ASOST that it really doesn't change much. Is it because of the intrastromal location? We don't know that. Is it uh, because cross-linking freezes it in place? Again, we don't know that. But we're seeing that it doesn't change. And similar results have also been uh, described by in Mario Nubile and Slack, uh, where he also says that his intrastromally uh, placed uh, uh, tissue does not change in, in, in uh, thickness with time. And that, that's basically a slightly different technique where he places a complete lenticule, which also over, goes over the visual axis. So that's not an arc shapes insert, but rather a, a, a round uh, lamellar insert, which goes over the visual axis. Uh, again, another example from 2017 to 2021, four and a half years later, and you can see again, 350 microns thickness. And in 2021, 369, I think, thickness uh, of the segment, uh, 31, 310 microns on this side and 320 microns on this side. So obviously, it is really not uh, shrinking with time. Other examples showing, uh, you know, DALC done on this side and uh, CARES done on this side. And you can see in the DALC, I actually, we got a progression for this young girl. Uh, she's probably around 20, 22 years old. And she came recently in 2022. And you can see the progression that was happening. Uh, superior cornea, surprisingly, was uh, progressing from uh, 2018 uh, to 2022. You can see the progression has increased. Uh, whereas in uh, CARES with prosnicking, very happily to our delight, she remained stable over the years, you know, right from 2016 to 2022. And these are the two eyes. The surgery, as you can see, done beautifully in both the eyes. Uh, very quiet corneas, good graft, good care segment. Everything remained beautifully, but the CARES did not progress. The eye had stabilized, but the DAL still continued to progress. And uh, the other advantage of CARES as compared to other uh, addition technologies uh, such as SLAC or even DAC is that, as I already mentioned, the visual axis is completely clear. So there's no fear of, um, of uh, interface haze. There's no fear of something happening over the visual axis. There's no glare. There's no loss of contrast sensitivity. Everything is uh, he's seeing unhindered through his own stroma. So that's a big advantage. Cosmetically also very good. You can see this is the patient and really you cannot uh, see that patient uh, just by looking at him uh, that uh, there are segments in his eye. Of course, on the slit lamp image, you'll be able to make it out. Uh, so I'll, with that, I'll conclude my talk. Uh, just, just, just a conclusion slide. Uh, CARES, we know, is allogenic tissue of any source or any type. Uh, it does not have disadvantages of synthetic segments. It is biocompatible. These are the advantages. It has good corneal integration and less complications, such as neovasoresin, stromal melts, and so on. It's easily available and easy to, at least in many countries such as ours, it's easily available and economical. But even otherwise, you could use uh, a single donor cornea for uh, CARES and uh, maybe the remaining part of it for um, DALG or PK or uh, you know DMEC or PREC or any of that. Uh, it's easy to perform using the pull-through cushion technique. You could use manual or femtosecond laser dissected channels for the patient. We found it to be really effective. Uh, we found it to give stable results. It's a simple, safe technique. It's reversible and adjustable, as I showed you. It does not take away the ability to perform any kind of uh, uh, keratoconus uh, treatment in the future. It retains all of the patient's stroma. And the best part is it's got very low levels of rejection. 
And uh, the, when I'm asked this question, you know, why so? Uh, the answers that I, uh, that I have is uh, possibly because of the very low level of stromal transfer, even compared to a DAG, which by itself has low level of rejection. In case you're hardly transplanting any tissue at all, there's no epithelium or endothelium transfer at all. And it's so small and it's surrounded by host cornea on all sides. You know, it's not just above and below, but on the sides and everywhere that from the host, the keratocytes, host's own keratocytes very rapidly enter the care segment and repopulate it. Uh, uh, so that's another reason why it's, uh, the antigenicity decreases. Uh, it's placed far from the limbus. There are no, uh, you know, sutures here as you would get in DAL. Uh, it's, uh, so there's no vascularization that could enter from the limbal blood vessels. And there are no sutures or any other, you know, neurotrophic uh, cornea or anything of that sort or a poor surface which can incite neovascularization. And also the host stroma above and below it isolates it from both the isolates it from both the tears and the aqueous humor, which can contain high immune factor concentration. So it's a completely sequestered tissue which generally lies there quietly. And uh, and even in the worst case scenario, if projection does happen, uh, it doesn't matter really because uh, the visual axis is not covered. As I said, it's spared. And so even if it rejects all hap that happens, a slight change in color, which again is not seen because we've had this one patient uh, in mine and Jack Parker's uh, combined series uh, where we got the rejection incidence of 0.5%, which is far, far less than that of DALC also. And that patient responded, this happened in his case actually, and uh, that responded immediately with the steroids uh, and it just settled down very fast. So uh, so that those are the advantages. Uh, and, uh, and with that, I think I will come to the end of my talk. Uh, and once again, thank you, uh, Dr. Gede, for having invited me here and, uh, you know, offered me this uh, really generous invitation of uh, presenting on this topic. I hope I was audible and clear throughout. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much. What a lecture, Dr. Susan Jacob. Incredible presentation. That was remarkable. And now, fellow ophthalmologists, now we are approaching the question and answer session. Uh, Susan, please open the question and answer uh, chat box. Yeah, yeah, okay. So you can read uh, the answer okay. and uh, the, the read the question and answer its question, please. Yeah, yeah. So basically, uh, one question is, uh, where would I get where the first question is, where would I be able to get the double bladed, -bladed punch? Uh, this uh, punch is manufactured by Madhu Surgicals, uh, which is in New Delhi, India. And uh, uh, just uh, as part of this question, anybody who is interested, obviously, if you're interested in starting cares, please uh, just email me and I'll be able to help you with the procedure, with the planning and everything, even with the topographic, uh, you know, interpretation. And in fact, I have been doing this for, uh, for many years for all the, uh, you know, the many, many doctors around the world. They do, when they start off, they do, uh, you know, uh, communicate and, you know, I, I help them start off. And then it's really a technique with a low learning curve. So it's really very easy to do this. <coughs> Pass. So please, uh, my email is available on all my videos, which are there online. It starts with my email. If you don't have it with you already, please take it from there and please feel free to email me. Uh, do you experience post-operative severe infection in this procedure? No, we have not experienced post-operative severe infection, but uh, infections are a complication of any surgical procedure. So uh, yes, if you ask me theoretically, can it happen? Yes, it can happen, but uh, it's it would be about as much as an OPK or a you know, penetrating graft or anything. Uh, really the incidence and the fear of not doing it just because of infection is less. In fact, uh, with time, uh, you may get a keratitis, infectious keratitis with plastic segments, uh, less than with, uh, more than with, uh, you know, a with cares because cares once it's integrated, it becomes part of the host cornea. The next technique uh, that someone asked is uh, why this technique finished with cross-linking and what is the consideration? So, uh, basically cross-linking because CARES by itself changes the topography. So what CARES does is it improves the topography. It may also have a small role in uh, decreasing progression just by changing the shape. So when you look at a keratoconic cornea, there's one point or one area at least which is very thin and which is the most protuberant area. And all the you know forces from within the eye are you know acting at that area and causing it to protrude out more and more. So obviously when you regularize the topography, the in the intraocular pressure and everything is spread out more evenly. The stress forces on the cornea spread out more evenly. So the chances of uh, decreasing progression just by uh, regularizing the topography is also there, but it's far, far less than the, the stabilization that you get with cross-linking. So cross-linking is the answer to stabilize the cornea. With CARES, you are getting more of visual benefits uh, in terms of both quality of vision, 
the amount of lines or the quantity of vision that the patient can read, the spherocylindrical error that the patient has, uh, uncorrected and best corrected visual acuity, all of these improve. Uh, the you know, aberrations come down, uh, everything uh, comes down, but the stabilis stabilization of the keratoconus still has to be done with cross-linking. So unless the patient is already in a non-progressive age group or you have documented that there's no progression, I would combine this with cross-linking. Uh, okay, so the next question is, when do we choose plastic intrastromal segments and uh, when do we choose corneal tissue intrastromal segments? Uh, so I have completely stopped plastic intrastromal segments since 2015. I have completely stopped it because, uh, you know, when you do a certain number of cases, you realize that they do come back with complications over time. So we have completely stopped it and we've been so happy with our results with CARES that uh, we do only CARES for all patients. So that, that would be my answer to this question. Can frozen graft be used for CARES or must it be fresh? No, you can use frozen graft also, uh, but it has to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, what should I say? Uh, it, it obviously has to be properly preserved graft. You cannot have a graft that has not been preserved or you're uh, suspicious of its quality in terms of, you know, uh, the sterility, then uh, please don't take any chances with it because these are young patients. But if you're sure of the sterility, then you can. Uh, the thing is that you would have to have other nomograms uh, for frozen grafts. So that those nomograms you would have to work on because frozen grafts, the structure would be slightly different from uh, fresh cut tissue. The term CARE stands for allogenic tissue, corneal allogenic intrastromal ring segments. It is not um, specific for fresh tissue. It is for any type of allogenic tissue. So yes, you can use frozen graft also for CARES. Uh, so the next question is, can you do this CARES after failure of the first op? So I'm not sure which first op you mean. Uh, maybe you mean uh, failure of the first DALC or failure of the first C3R. Uh, if it's failure of a first DALC, I personally have not yet done uh, CARES on a DALC or CARES uh, on a, if you've done a PK for a patient and it fails, obviously there's no point of doing CARES. Uh, you would have to uh, do either uh, endothelial keratoplasty or repeat PK for that patient. But if a DALC has failed, you need to know why the DALC failed. Is it because the topography is not good enough? There's still irregular astigmatism. Then you could try CARES, though I haven't yet done it personally. Even with my huge humongous experience with it, I haven't done it. That's a theoretical option. You would have to make very small uh, uh, channels within the DALC and then do it. Uh, if the DALC has failed because of some other reasons like neovascularization, lipid exudation, uh, interface haze and all, then of course CARES is not going to help. Uh, you would have to change the stroma completely. And that's the reason you prefer to do a CARES first and keep the other options for last. If it is due to failure of cross-linking and progression of the cornea still, despite having done cross-linking, yes, you can very well combine it with CARES because uh, then you, you get the option of doing a CARES, improving the topography, and then doing a second C3R or a second cross-linking, which would really be a great benefit of great benefit to the patient. Uh, there's another question uh, that is, is there any limited age to perform this procedure? No, there isn't. As I said, we have done, even our youngest patient was, I think, an eight-year-old. So we've been, we have been doing it in pediatric cases also because now with better diagnostics and more awareness among the patients, we, we all, I'm sure if you're a corneal specialist, you do see, realize that uh, you often see children with keratoconus in the uh, in your clinic. And some of these children are really aggressive. They're eye rubbers. They have the severe vernal keratoconjunctivitis and they have this... Uh, even without severe vernal keratoconus, sometimes they come with very advanced keratoconus. So those patients I do combine with CARES and cross-linking. If they are associated with severe VKC or vernal keratoconjunctivitis, then I would treat the surface first, get the disease into uh, you know, remission and then do a CARES and cross-linking because you don't want to do any surgery with the poor surface. So remember that. Uh, do you have any suggestion on how to perform FACO after this procedure and how to calculate the IOL power? So yes, you can perform FACO uh, after this procedure. Uh, uh, the I IOL power, we, we, are, we have actually taken the, all our patients and we are at a, quite a good number now. I think we must be uh, close to about 300 to 400 cases of CARES, but we've got our data. IOL power is something that we've take, taken all the patients preoperatively. So we have lots of studies that we need to do, pull out the data and do. And one of the studies that's in the pipeline is how it differs pre-op and post-op uh, IOL power. So in some time, I would be able to cal answer this question better. Not yet, I'm sorry. Uh, but as in keratoconus, CAS doesn't completely make the topography normal. You have to realize this. It doesn't make it normal. It makes it better. It makes it far better, but not normal. So you all the 
confusions that happen with IUL power calculation ketoconic patients will still be there. Ketoconus, irregular astigmatism, uh, irregular corneas will always have some amount of IUL power calculation difficulties associated with them and those will still continue. Uh, would you like to also, uh, CAS would bring about some amount of posterior corneal changes also. So those would also be factors that would uh, be important in terms of IOL power calculation. Uh, would you like to explain more about corneal crosslinking following corneal allogenic interstromal ring segments? Okay. Uh, corneal crosslinking is actually a completely different talk. I, I think I already mentioned some amounts uh, on it. If you have uh, corneal stroma more than 400 microns, then you can do... Uh, normal uh, cross-linking, you could do either resident protocol or you could do accelerated protocol. If you're doing accelerated protocol, it's not wise to go for very flash cross-linkings because they don't really work. Uh, so you, so some ideal settings would be about 10 milliwatts for nine second, nine minutes or nine milliwatts for 10 minutes. Those are some really good settings which give you uh, adequate amount of strengthening while also decreasing the amount of time taken. Uh, or you could do Dresden for children. Sometimes you prefer to do Dresden because Dresden does, uh, that is three milliwatts the per centimeter square for 30 minutes that actually gives you more strengthening than uh, oh, even accelerated cross linking so for children you would sometimes prefer to do a resident yeah. protocol because children are more aggressive if it is thin corneas uh, that is stroma less than 400 microns then you can go for uh, i my personal preference as a contact lens assisted corneal cross linking technique so CACXL combined with CAS and we do, do we've been doing a large number of this CACXL is another technique that I started in 2012 and since then we are doing only CACXL for all our thin corneas and we've got huge amount of experience with this as well it's not just us actually there are a lot of papers that have now come out from other centers on both CACXL and CARES which shows the validity of our techniques so we've got centers from US from uh, papers from US from India from many Israel and many other countries on both CACXL and if you just go online and search contact lens assisted corneal crosslinking, or if you search uh, CARES or allogenic tissue segments, you'll see that now a lot of people have started doing and started publishing their own results with these techniques. Um, how can we learn about corneal allogenic interstromal ring segments? Do you have any fellowship programs related to it? We do have a lot of fellowship programs in our hospital. Uh, for which if you're interested, I can kind of connect you to the administrator who's in charge of this. Uh, and uh, I'm sure he'll be able to guide you. We've had a few fellows who have come in to learn CARES, but CARES is not a very uh, high uh, or a steep, it doesn't have a very steep learning curve. You know, it's actually relatively simple. Once you do a few cases, it's really easy to do it. I, unlike DAL, DAL has a really steep learning curve. So, so it's really much more easier to do. So here's one more question. I had corneal transplantation and I use Optiprid and Britospot eye drop since two years. What do you advise me? I am not sure what Britospot is. Uh, maybe it's brimonidine. I am really not sure what that eye drop is. Uh, Optiprid, of course, is prednisolone. So that's a little vague information. Corneal transplantation, it would uh, ha have to be supplemented with more information. Is it a penetrating keratoplasty or a DALC? Uh, you know, uh, it depends on that. Uh, and for what reason are you using Optiprid? It sounds like you might have had a penetrating keratoplasty because if it was a DALC, it would have possibly stopped by now or maybe they gave you Optiprid for vascularization. Really, I would not know for what indication Optiprid is being used right now. I'm not aware of what Britospot is also. So really it's difficult to give a medical opinion without actually seeing the patient and examining. All right, Susan, thank you so much. And the next question, maybe in the text, uh, chat box from Dr. Abdul El Ghani Terfak, this is from Algeria. Can laser based correction such topo guided treatment after cares be done thank you okay and yeah, how yes. long yeah uh, and how long cares cannot be extract after implantation yeah uh cares laser correction can be done after cares in fact uh, we have a uh, uh, a center in Canada and another in Australia who are planning a study on this where they are going to do topography topography guided PRK post care so they are already doing topographic guided prk for their patients but what happens when you do tgprk for keratoconus patients is that you are very limited of course you can't remove because they are keratoconic patients the amount of tissue that you remove that you can possibly remove safely is very very low so for advanced keratoconus when you remove that low level of tissue for tgprk it really does not give you much effect at all so what they're planning to do is put in cares, bring the huge amount of, you know, flattening with that. And then the limited amount of uh, TGPRK tissue removal that is that can be done then is, is safe to, you know, uh, to get you a much better result. So that's what is Bioplex where you can combine these uh, treatments. And I'm happy to say that because uh, so many people have now started doing cares around the world, these combinations are also being, uh, you know, done by different uh, patients. Your other question was how long can 
uh, cares be explanted. Uh, cares, I told you the case that I explained, that's the only case I've had to explain where I, it was done after one year. But uh, uh, I'm sure it can be explanted further down also. It would be much like a DSEC uh, lenticule. Uh, DSEC lenticules, we know uh, sometimes DSEC patients come back with rejection. Uh, those are first endothelial keratoplasty. It's a completely different surgery. So, but however, uh, that's also tissue. That's also conjugal tissue, which is stuck uh, uh, with, with just the capillary, uh, you know, interactions or the capillary uh, force that is there. So, and then of course, there's some adhesion around the edges. These are lenticules can also be stripped off. Uh, you have to break down the adhesions at the edges, and then you can see that it can be easily stripped off. And that was exactly my experience with CARES, where I had to break down the adhesions uh, on the edges, and then I could uh, pull it out. So I'm sure uh, you can extract it much later also. So I, I don't think that would be a problem. I hope that answers the questions. I cannot hear you, Gere, uh, for some reason. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> Double amazing, Susan. More than 20 questions have been answered by our super maestra at this very moment. Great speaker, great audience. So awesome. Bravo. Thank you so much, Susan. Here we are spreading love, care, peace, and tranquility on earth. Thank you, SMAC Group. Thank you, ID. Thank you, Perdami Sumut. Thank you, Anak Sudarti Foundation. And thank you, all committee. Thank you, our distinguished participants from all around the world. And to our maestra, Dr. Susan Jacob. Please send our regard to your family. Thank you so much, Susan. You are absolutely great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gede. I'm, I'm really happy and honored that you invited me. And thank you for all the participants and the attendees who, uh, who you know, I, I really took so much of interest and asked so many questions. I, I'm really thank you so, thanking you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. You are so great, Susan. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye bye. And fellow ophthalmologists, tomorrow we will hold another one national webinar in Bahasa Indonesia. Uh, you can see the link in chat box. And the next month we will hold an international webinar with Professor Boris Malyugin. Collaboration among Theodore of Institution, SMEC, and Uni Universitas Airlangga, Surabaya, Indonesia. You can find the links on the chat box. The link also will be sent via email, and the certificate will be sent hopefully before two weeks after now. Your participation is highly appreciated. appreciated. See you all, my friend. Thank you so much. Happy Ramadan Karim. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much.